someone that I really admire a lot, Mr. Dinesh Akar, the guest, to speak with us about Thank you. Uh, sure. Is that working? I, okay, cool. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Hi, it's good to see some friends. We have, yes, uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ellie, for having me. Um, I, was, I was just telling Ellie when we were getting started, I was like, there is no way we're starting on time. I was like, there is no way, there's no way. Hello, yes, we meet again. Um, I was like, there's no way we're starting on time. We're definitely going to be Malaysian timing. We're going to start late. And here we are, right? <laughs> as, as predicted, as predicted. Um, okay, good morning everyone. My name is Dinesha. Um, a bit about me, um, I do a lot of work in the arts. Um, storyteller, theatre maker. I am currently the artistic director for Theatre Source, which is a Kuala Lumpur-based theatre company started in 2017. Uh, and uh, today's conversation, I really would like it to be a bit of a conversation um, because I'm hoping to also learn from everyone here, okay? Um, so I think the first place I'd like to start is this, this this, this word, right, perspective. When you think of the word perspective, um, what are some things that come to mind? Just, just go for it, yes. Maybe our thoughts, our way of thinking. Okay, thoughts, way of thinking. Anybody, just, just feel free. Angles. Sorry? Different, different angles. Different angles, okay. Any other perspectives? Lens. Lens, okay. Point of view. Point of view. How we move through the world? Last one? No? Okay. So let me give you another word. Uh, when you hear the word minority, what do you think of? Marginalized. Marginalized? Small. Small? I think we don't need the mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's release myself from the mic. Uh, sorry, I heard something just now? Ignored. Ignored? What else? Vulnerable. Vulnerable? Underestimated. How about the word um, underrepresented? What other words come to mind? Orang asli. Orang asli, yes. Indigenous. What else? Sorry? Status. Status? Stateless. Stateless, yes. What else? Foreign workers. Foreign workers, yeah. Any other thoughts on this? What I'm trying to do today is, uh, with this topic of perspective, to sort of have like a bit of a through line with all of these points, right? These points that you've mentioned with regards to these words. I don't think any of those POVs or perspectives are wrong. In fact, I think they're all connected. They are our very own perspectives and POVs, right? Sometimes when we talk about things like mar uh, marginalization, minority, underrepresentation, or even representation, we get a lot of words, a lot of words, right? All these different words might come up. Some words we understand, and some words we don't really have context for, for what this means and what, the, what we are thinking of, right? In fact, some of these words have different meanings depending on where you are, right? Uh, I've been hearing a lot from friends who do a lot of research work, this topic of global majority, right? That has come up in research, which then reflects us, who are minorities. It's complicated, right? The reason why I throw this here is because I think when we talk about perspectives, when we talk about representation, um, it can get really overwhelming, right? Uh, am I doing enough? Uh, can I do more? What should I do? All of those things, right? So I want to sort of maybe the, give you the thought that today, with regards to perspective, what I really want us to think about is this. What questions are we asking, right? I feel like that's very important in terms of understanding perspective or thinking about perspective. And the specific question I want you to be thinking about as I sort of share my journey is this question, who is in the room? Okay? Uh, just, just hold on to that thought. I'll, I'll make sense of it in a bit. But I, I want you to just think of this question, who is in the room? And the word room is also interchangeable with a lot of other things. Okay. So I want to frame today's sharing based on my experience in the arts. Um, and so we go back to 2017. Uh, in 2017, I started doing spoken word poetry, which is why, how I met some of you all. Uh, and uh, it, th I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of my journey because it's impossible to tell you every project, everything I was involved in. So I'll give you the one that is connected to perspective, to representation, 
uh, to marginalization and all of those things, right? So 2017, start poetry. Um, I start performing spoken word poetry. Uh, had gotten involved in theater before that, but 2017 was I wrote my first play, staged it, wrote my second play. It will never see the light of day. It was terrible. Uh, <laughs> So bad, so bad. I sent it to the workshop coordinator and then I just sat there and went, oh my god, I cannot believe I wrote that. I feel like, Ugh. yeah, okay. Uh, this particular picture was taken at a Malaysia Day slash uh, Merdeka performance event. I was curated to perform. I was the only Indian poet. Um, and before I go up on stage, the host, um, who is like a Maharaja Lawak contestant person, um, he makes the statement, oh, I didn't know that Indians do poetry. Okay? I want to go back to the Sangam period of Tamil Nadu, but, you know, just keep quiet. And then he also does this, like, mock Tamil thing. On stage, eh? this is Lot 10. Sorry, Lot 10? No, Laoyat. The concourse area. This is like a stage, right? This actually happens on stage. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> okay. But I feel like this is relevant to this. Who is in the room? What are these conversations, right? So 2017, this happens. Uh, start doing poetry, poetry, theatre, poetry, theatre. 2018, similar. I do a show. Then in 2019, uh, I do this show, which is how I met Ellie. Um, sorry, it's very neon. Um, 2019, it's the show called The Human Exhibit, Sex and Gender, where I do it with, uh, with my co-producer, Ian Skatu. Uh, this is a show where we open a pitch to people. People come and present to us pieces that they feel we should add into the programming. Um, and so people come with all kinds of ideas, different things they want to talk about the topic, right? Um, and this is where my perspective starts shifting a little because I start to realize there are things that I am more fascinated by as a maker. Uh, the person top right, Para, uh, Para comes in and auditions, he performs like his dance piece and I decide, okay, you know what, I want to work with him as a director. And we craft a piece about this little boy, uh, little in high school, this boy by the name of Krishna, who is dealing with very interesting feelings within his body, wanting to dance, but also feeling I'm a boy, I shouldn't dance, and his relationship to God and all of those things, right? So we craft a little piece. And working one-on-one -on -one with this actor, I start to sort of realize, wow, I've never had these conversations before. I've never sat down with another brown man and talked about what it was like growing up. Talked about what it was like being different. Talked about how artistic uh, feels within our body, right? So we do that show. Uh, the same, around the same time and within the context of this show, Pera and I uh, also shoot like a music video short film called Snehidane, which is a remake of uh, Mani Ratnam's Snehidane, Ali Payude, his film. It's a song from the movie. But we remake it in the context of two boys, instead of uh, a straight couple, which is what the context is within the original film. Right? Again, I'm confronted with this sense of like, well, I, like, in my 20 plus years of my life, I've never thought this visual was important. I never thought it was necessary to have one, brown people on screen, but two, brown queer people on screen. Right? So we work on Snehidane. Snehidane um, also then becomes a comic that was part of a zine. I had a friend illustrate it. Um, in 2019, I also started a podcast called the Creative Curry Podcast. Do you see a trend? Uh, <laughs> to be fair, I don't know how the name came about. Uh, I, I, it's not really intentional, but Creative Curry was the one where I start to think about curation a little bit more. I start to think about programming a little bit more. So for our first season, I insist that we will only platform female creatives. Uh, writers, uh, artists, and things like that. And very intentionally, I'm only going to work with female creatives. And that was the first time I realized, wow, there is a, there is a power in the choices I'm making. I, I have now this choice, this power that I didn't realize I could have, that I could be, I'm only going to platform women, right? I only want to talk to women creatives about their journey and their perspective, okay? Same year, you start to notice it's like an escalation, right? Uh, in, in 2019, I also work on a musical uh, written by Nave Vijay where he comes and it's about this boy who wants to be creative uh, but is struggling with responsibility. We call it Brown Boy Dreams. Um, I'm also part of a visual arts like performance installation, Roja Weaving a Women, a Woman, with uh, my collaborator Vishalini Naidu. It's a visual art installation 
where we, we go through Klang Valley and uh, Negeri Sembilan and we collect saris. Uh, and so we do like this massive sari donation drive. People call us everywhere. I'm in Klang, I'm in PD, we're just collecting saris. People are like, I got so many giving us boxes and bags. And so we're collecting these saris and in that conversation, we start talking to these women. We start talking to them about when they wore their first sari. We talk about why they wear the sari or why they don't wear the sari anymore. And then we build an installation. We build this installation where audiences can then add their stories to the installation. They talk about when they first saw a woman in a sari, when uh, their relationship to the garment and things like that. I think we start with nine stories and by the time the installation is done, in about two weeks, we collect 74 stories from people who just come and add. And so, because saris are pinned together by, paper, uh, by clips, we give them paper and clips. So they write on paper and they clip their stories to the installation. So what I'm also sort of showing you with 2019 is that by having conversations with people, by working with different people, I start realizing there is something important here, something relevant, something that is speaking to me a lot more. And then this show happens, Bohemia. I don't do this show, I watch the show. Uh, this show is by Theatre Source, the company I'm now part of. Um, 2019, uh, the director was Kelvin Wong, the founder of Theatre Source. Uh, he does this show and I leave this show angry. So angry, so, so angry. I write this very long Facebook post where I review the show, where I talk about my issues with the show, on how it, um, so if you're not familiar with queer culture in Malaysia, uh, queer culture in Malaysia is also broken down by race. Uh, there is a certain dynamic, there is power in play there. And in my opinion, the show basically uh, mimicked the exact same power structures that exist in the queer community here. Which made me very upset because for a show that was trying to reimagine Malaysia, it didn't do a lot of reimagining. Okay? So I had this very, very long post. I know it sets people upset. But Kelvin, founder of Theatre Source, he sends me a message and said, let's do coffee. And so we sit down, which is a lot of grace, yeah? Somebody just basically ripped your show to sh shreds, and he chooses to have coffee with me. And we sit down and we start talking about what he learned from the conversation, what he wished he could have done, and things like that, and then we become friends. So much so that I have now taken over the company, right? <laughs> that, 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 is the, that, is the, that is the journey, right, from angry reviewer to artistic director. That's the, that's the pipeline, okay? So, but if you notice, what I noticed with this review in particular is that all the questions I'm asking sort of compounded and became this show and I started questioning more. Then we enter the pandemic, right? And we're all stuck at home and we don't know what to do with ourselves. And uh, 2020 was the year I turned 29, which to me was a big year because uh, very conflicted feelings. 29 was the year my father had me, right? Uh, so for me, it's like, oh my God, 29. My father had me, I was born, but I'm still single, and then, uh -huh, all of that. Lah, okay? So I decided to do a series in June called 30 Days of Pride, uh, framed around this idea of Bangga Tak Jadi Anak Malaysia, where I speak to 30 people for 30 days, every day at 7pm, uh, and we have a conversation on different topics. Right? Over the course of 30 days, I talk to 30 people, all kinds of conversations. We talk about representation, we talk about inclusion, we talk about just life, right? At that point, uh, Sugu Pavitra was a thing, right? Uh, this couple that rose to fame suddenly for cooking, that was one of our conversations, right? And by the time the 30 days was over, I had learned so much from my guests. I had learned new questions, new things to think about. But what was interesting about my curation is that every single day, I spoke to a brown person. Every single day, I spoke to a different Malaysian Indian person. All artists, all creatives. And when I was done with this, I sat there and I went, all these people who go around and curate things and do panels and do all of these things where there's no Indian people there, I can do 30 days in a row. And they're just people I know. <laughs> Which to me was a bit wild, lah, the fact that I was able to curate something like this and the people who said yes. Right? In fact, there were, I actually reached out to I think about 45 people, 15 people said no. So if this one KL boy is able to curate such a selection and ask all these questions, I was very confused at that point. I was like, I don't know why people are not doing that more. So then we come to another show um, that I also review. Again, I don't make the show, I watch the show. This is a play by Alfian Saad 
that uh, Instant Cafe Theatre put up in 2020. Again, watch the show, very angry. Uh, <laughs> and, but I think with this show in particular, all of the thoughts I had, so remember 2020 is also Black Lives Matter. Uh, 2020 is this great reckoning on race. Uh, 2020 is also um, when the whole Kasturi Pato incident happened. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It happened in, uh, I, I can't remember the details, but it was a lot going on race-wise, right? Um, and so Para goes up, and in, I won't go into the details of the show, but it's basically about this, this group of high school friends. And so Mahesh, the character on the right, um, is called the K-word, so if you're not familiar with the K-word, uh, it's the word killing, um, and it's a derogatory term usually used against Indians, uh, usually meant derogatorily. And in the play, within the first 30 minutes, because I start keeping track, Mahesh is called the K-word at least 15 times. In the context of his friendships. Like, in fact, one of his friends say, oh, I'm doing this so that you get desensitized to the word. So, in my opinion, I get very frustrated with this because to me, this was written by a Singaporean Malay playwright uh, and Mahesh goes through the absolute worst in the context of this play. So then I ask questions and I think different questions this time, right? I ask questions like, how do we make anti-racist theatre? Because that's what's happening in the US, right? We're talking about anti-racism and all those things. So I ask questions about how do we make anti-racist theatre? How do we... Um, how do we question the very systems and structures we exist in? How do we change the narratives that we're used to, right? And so then Kelvin, remember Kelvin, Theatre Sauce? He reaches out for what is known as the Emerging Directors Lab, where me and four other directors, correct, four, uh, me and four other directors are, are chosen to go through this year-long intensive, think a master's in theatre making, um, except we, ours was like two years because of the pandemic and lockdowns. And we're trained in the art of asking questions and thinking about theatre and making theatre and thinking about dramaturgy, which is the socio-political questions of making theatre, right? And in the course of Emerging Directors Lab, I start doing research on how many Indian actors are in English theatre, uh, how many shows feature Indian bodies, how many shows feature Indian writers, and that's just theatre, okay? I haven't even started on film and all the other ecosystems of the arts, right? And then I start doing work within the context of EDL, because we have to do showcases, um, where I start to do a little bit more work. So there aren't a lot of Malaysian Indian playwrights, uh, at least of the newer generation, so I'd go to Singapore. I start reaching out to Singaporean writers, stage my first show with Singaporean writers. Then I work on this show, which is our second showcase, uh, Malegal Koda Veligi Pogum, which is Even Mountains Will Depart, which is a piece of work that I make with two brown men. Right? And in the course of that, remember when I was talk, working with Para, I start realizing, oh my god, I'm again, I've never had these conversations. I've never sat down with people similar to me with similar lived experiences and thought about these things, about what it is to be in our bodies, to exist and to tell our stories. Right? Um, one of the things about this work is that we were using the staircase of Theatre Thoughts. And so what we did was we covered the walls with... Uh, quotes and writing, but we also covered the walls with headlines in Malaysian newspapers that talk positively about Indian people, right? Which is a lot harder than you would think to find. And, and so we start doing this research, right? We start noticing what's happening big, in a bigger perspective. Uh, Maligal was also then turned into a short film, uh, which we're currently editing. That same year, as part of the showcase, I do Raga Lila Abhinaya, which is a uh, performance piece based on a short story from a Malaysian writer by the name of Agilin, uh, which combines family drama and Bharatanatyam. Okay? But again, you'd notice every show is an escalation, right? It's a deepening into, okay, there's something here that I keep wondering, representation, untold stories, underrepresentation, and all of those things. So we do Raga Lila Abhinaya in 2022. There are other shows around this time as well. And then we come to last year, where I do They All Die at the End at the Kuala Lumpur Performing Arts Center. Uh, they All Die at the End featured five Malaysian Indian actors, which has never been done before in Malaysian theater, uh, at least in the English side. Um, and over the course of three, four months, me and my five actors cover all kinds of things within our rehearsal process. We talk about what it was like to be us. We talk about um, 
our lived experience, we talked about our hopes, our dreams, do we want to stay in Malaysia, do we want to leave? And in the greatest irony of all time, we finished rehearsal in Subang one day, and we are on the way for lunch, and uh, I think four of us, so three of my actors, one, two, yeah, four of my actors and me, so five of us, we are on the way to lunch, and we get stopped by the police. Um, and the only reason we are stopped is because there are five brown men in the car. <laughs> and we were like, Nala, cannot be. And then we realized every single car that stopped is brown. They're all men. And the first thing the Abang police says when he rolls down the window and looks at us is he says, Kasi IC atau passport. So give me your IC or your passports. And we're all sitting there and going, Who, which Malaysian walks around with their passports? And then I realized, oh, he doesn't think we're local. He doesn't think we are Malaysian, right? And, and so then we go through this ordeal because I didn't bring my IC. I left my wallet in the rehearsal space. Uh, my, the driver's road tax, this was when that digital road tax thing was starting to happen. His road tax was not renewed. And we go through this whole thing, which we then record and put in the show. OK? Um, and one of the things about this experience that really taught me is that this question about who is in the room um, is really actually this question. Who is not in the room? And when I say room, uh, we can replace room with ads, film, commercials, power structures, meeting rooms, conference rooms, any of those things. Okay? When you look around a room and you are in a position of power, the question to really think about is who is not there with you? Because there are perspectives, there are POVs that you are missing. Okay? For example, uh, just to like look at this room, uh, there isn't anyone obviously differently abled. Right? In fact, I don't even know, I, I'm not really sure what accessibility looks like. Right? Um, and so what you would find is that in a lot of decision making spaces, the people, the, there are people whose stories are not being told and who are not present in those spaces. Because, let's be totally honest, we all have blind spots. As a, despite being a queer man, uh, I was raised a man. <laughs> so I know I am missing female perspectives. Uh, I've had conversations with fellow queer playwrights where we have to be very conscious of how we write women. Because we don't realize that, despite being gay or queer, um, we sometimes write women badly because we were raised as men, right? We all have blind spots. I will have blind spots with regards to indigenous or an asli, undocumented, statelessness. These are all things that I have blind spots. And so the reason I also mention this is because when we did the show, They All Die at the End, um, which was a show that was very difficult to make because we, something of that sort had never existed before. So we had no template. I had no template. It was a very difficult process to make the show. On opening night, um, we have someone who um, is seated in the audience. Uh, I won't go into context of what state of mind he was in, but he was very upset with my show. So he proceeds to hackle my actors from the audience. 150 people, this one fuller is choosing to make his voice super loud. And so audiences are getting disturbed. And I've never experienced something like that. So I have no context into why he's doing this. Right? Why is he so upset? Um, I then later on find out who this person is. We don't talk that night. But then I reach out to the person who knows him. And similar to Kelvin, I decide to have coffee with him. I sit down with the person who came to my show and heckled my, me and my actors. And he shared a very specific and interesting story about being raised as a B40 Malaysian Indian man and his friends who are dead or in prison. And when he watched my show, I think he felt that he was not represented. As someone who went through extreme hardship, as, as someone who has lost friends and all of these things. So even with the greatest of intentions of trying to tell a story that talked about the Malaysian Indian male experience, I missed things. There were things I was not able to do because that was not my lived experience. I could try to talk about it, but there were lines and things that I was not able to do. Right? Which is why when we go back to that question, who's not in the room, I think a lot of times uh, a good space to think about is what perspectives are missing when we make work, 
when we make executive decisions, uh, when we make difficult choices, because there are people we are not thinking of, right? And to be fair, this, this idea of uh, perspectives or POVs or representation, marginalization, all of those things that come into play with me and my work now with Theatre Source as we focus on minority Malaysian stories, um, there are points that I will miss. And so my job is to try and find people who can help cover those blind spots, right? Uh, over the years, I've had many, uh, these are just some people who I've thought of, who have played a role in shaping my thought process. A lot of people. And these are just the names I could think of when I was putting together the set of slides, right? Um, people I met once, people I met through writing, people I had conversations with, different people who helped me get a different perspective, who helped me understand things differently, who helped me question things differently. So the question that I guess I'd like to leave us with um, is that who, because it's very big, right? It's very big to think about changing the world or fixing things. I think the question I'd like us to think about is who can I bring along? How can I bring people along? If you're in a room, if you're in a space where you have some level of power and uh, you are able to make decisions, look around the room and see who else needs to be in that room. What other perspectives can you bring along? Who else can you uplift? Because I don't think any one person can change the state of what we live in. But I think if everybody makes that little bit extra, like, OK, you know what? I'm going to bring this perspective. I'm going to bring this friend. I'm going to bring this person. I'm going to make sure this person's in the room. I'm going to make an allocation to ensure that this level of perspective is added. I think we could move things along in a particular way. That's it. Thank you so much. My name is Anesha Gadevich.